Today, we're going to cover a new, well, not totally new, supplement on the block that have been making quite a lot of noise. A lot of you have been bugging me about this like a bunch of fussy critters <laughs> and insects. Just insects. Don't really have another pun. The recent talk of the town is about the supplement known as terkesterone. If you're not familiar with it, terkesterone falls into a group called ectesteroids, which are natural steroid hormones deriving from plants and, as you might have guessed, insects. Buggy, crittery insects. Regardless of its interesting source, why do some think terkesterone might be the next big supplement? Well, if we're being completely honest, it's probably entirely thanks to very intense marketing, but that's another story. In terms of proposed effects, it most likely stems from the fact that ectesteroids, like terkesterone, share a striking structural similarity to a little human hormone we call testosterone. And the hormone testosterone is known for effects like hair growth and bone density, but perhaps most relevant to us here is its anabolic effects like increased muscle growth and strength. Ectesteroids are kind of like the plant and insect variants of testosterone, beards and all. The big question is, if us humans were to consume it, can ectesteroids also act similarly to testosterone and help us with our beautiful gains? Well, one way to find out, as you guys might know, is to check the research. Hmm. Speaking of research, the amount we have on human trials kind of sucks. Which is surprising considering that the exploration of ectesteroids themselves is nothing new. We can trace publications all the way back to 1968 where Japanese researchers found that insect molting steroids, like ectesteroids, had a positive impact on mouse liver protein synthesis. But of course, mouse liver protein synthesis is far and away from human skeletal muscle growth. Unfortunately, human trials remain stagnant for many years after. Not only until 38 years later, in 2006, do we finally see our first relevant human trial. And in this eight-week trial, when resistance-trained subjects were given 200 milligrams daily of ectesterone, another ectesteroid, there were no significant differences found in all measured strength outcomes in body fat percentage nor fat-free mass. In other words, ectesterone had seemingly zero impact on performance and muscle growth. That's quite a dud of a finding after 38 years of waiting, which makes you think that researchers long ago might have already knew it wasn't worth the time. Especially for something so readily available like ectesteroids, if there were benefits, then certainly cash-grabbing supplement companies would have left no crickets nor snail shell unturned. But let's be fair, one study in 2006 is not enough for us to toss ectesteroids aside just yet. It would be nice to have more data. Luckily for us, 2019 called and threw us a bit more to work with. And it's probably this 2019 study that led to the crazy popularity we see in ectesteroids and terkesterone today. Because unlike the 2006 study, there were some very interesting results. This 2019 study also employed resistance trained participants but had two ectesterone groups this time. One taking two capsules daily, which the label equates to 200 milligrams of ectesterone per day, and a high dose group taking eight capsules, which should be 800 100 milligrams per day. After 10 weeks of training, strength in the bench press 1 rep max and to a lesser extent the back squat 1 rep max significantly improved in both ectesterone groups compared to a placebo group. Weight gain was also significantly higher in the ectesterone group with a notable increase in the high dose group. The same was found for muscle growth where we see big increases between the two intervention groups. Interestingly, the placebo group actually lost muscle mass which is quite unexpected since they did gain weight. At worst you would expect no muscle gain but a loss is definitely Definitely a WTF moment, at least in my opinion. However you cut it though, the gains made here were pretty substantial. But as we like to do around here, we have to look at some potential limitations of the study and <laughs> this one had quite a dilemma. Let's start with an uh, not that bad type of limitation first, which is sample size. With 46 subjects spread into four groups, one control, one placebo, and the two intervention groups, that's 12 subjects for each group except for 10 in the higher dose ectesterone group. That's not too much per group to strongly rule out statistical sampling errors and false positives. Especially with the 2006 study showing vastly different results, this only calls for more data to really figure out what's going on. The next limitation is the whole strange gain in weight but loss in muscle mass thing we saw in the placebo group. It really doesn't make much sense, but it might be explained by how the researchers measured muscle mass in the first place, which was through bioelectrical impedance analysis, or BIA. You might be familiar with BIA if you ever had a fitness analysis at your school or clinic where they had you hold one of those handlebar looking things and told you not to move for 15 seconds but it felt like 15 hours. BIA unfortunately has a bit of a reputation for not being entirely accurate in measuring body composition especially with detecting small incremental increases in muscle mass. The researchers did use a fancier multi-point BIA device though but accuracy is still a question mark here. It would be again nice to see more data in the future. 
But perhaps the most eye-catching problem was not with stats or measurements, but with the actual supplements. This thing. These supplements advertised to contain 100 milligrams of ecdysterone per capsule. But when the researchers actually analyzed the capsule in a lab, they found that the ecdysterone concentration was not 100 milligrams, not 75, not 50, not even 30 milligrams. It was 6 milligrams of actual ecdysterone per capsule. Eh, only off about 94%. Supplements containing lower than advertised concentrations are nothing new, but this much of a discrepancy is probably <laughs> a bit too much. But now, are we saying that not 200 milligrams of ecdysterone, but only 12, remember the low dose group took two capsules, is enough to elicit such significant increases in strength and mass? Or could there have been something more potent in the pills that led to the results? The researchers did perform a urine analysis on the subjects and did not detect any other enhancing drugs, so we might be able to rule that out to an extent. But 6 milligrams instead of 100, really, that's something we can't just ignore, and another perfect reason why more data would be very, very appreciated. Data, please help us out. But for now, that is the data we have, but there's one more thing we should talk about. With something like testosterone, we know how it works, its mechanism. Testosterone and other androgenic hormones like DHT activate its anabolic effects by interacting with androgen receptors. One way for ecdysteroids to have anabolic effects is to interact with these same androgen receptors. But based on what we know, it doesn't. We actually don't really know much of ecdysteroids mechanisms at all. The little that we do know is that it seems to interact with a receptor called estrogen receptor beta. Unfortunately, we've seen that activation of estrogen receptor beta through more potent substances like estradiol have yet to show any direct impact on performance or muscle growth outside of cell and animal studies. Interesting fact though, another plant-based compound known as isoflavones also interact with estrogen receptor beta, and the most common plant that can contains isoflavones is soy. And it's this interaction with estrogen receptors promoting estrogen-like effects that perpetuated the testosterone-killing myth about soy in which we disparagingly charge any consumer of soy as soy boys. Wouldn't it be quite a turn of events if terkesterone, which is heavily marketed to our testosterone-loving friends, to act no better than soy? Instead of being a soy boy, you might very well be a turk jerk? Couldn't think of a better rhyme for that, but if you did, please share it in the comments. Luckily, again, the whole thing about soy is a total myth, so don't worry, turkey jerky. And we still have yet to exactly discover how ecdysteroids work. Estrogen receptor beta is only one path. But if more information pops up in the future, I'll be sure to share it with all you beautiful people. For now though, if you're on the fence about taking turkesterone, I say save your money for things we already know works. Sure, some people, maybe yourself, have anecdotes about it being super helpful, but hey, we can't really rely on it to give full recommendations, or else I'd be recommending a digital pen if you want to get an amazing taper like mine. Until we get more information, Turk jerkin definitely won't be part of my daily regimen, but I won't judge you if it's part of yours. I want to give a shout out to Ben Escrow of Subsci. It was his presentation of ecdysteroids on the Iron Culture podcast that really helped me dive into the topic of ecdysteroid mechanisms. I highly recommend any of you interested in a more in-depth dive into turkesterone and ecdysteroids to check out that Iron Culture podcast episode, which I'll link in the description. Other than that, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a buggy thumbs up and share it with your insect-loving friends. Subscribe for more crickety videos. As always, thank you for watching and don't forget to get your insect protein. Well, you can get regular protein too. That's up to you.